Live via satellite, welcome to the Monday edition of the Bible Answer Man program presented by the Christian Research Institute. I'm Mike Stevens. CRI is a nonprofit organization founded by the late Dr. Walter Martin, a ministry dedicated to helping believers contend for their faith. Under the leadership of President Hank Hanegraaff, our staff of well-educated research experts are ready to answer your questions about the scripture, cults, the occult, atheism, world religions, even areas of false teachings from within the church. If you have a question in any of these areas, write it down and submit it to the research department at CRI. Our address is the Christian Research Institute, Post Office Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. I'll repeat our address again later on in the broadcast. Today, we'll be taking your calls on Catholicism and Reformation theology. Our toll-free numbers are 1-800-821-4490. Again, in the U.S., that's 1-800-821-4490. In Canada, dial 1-800-541-9437. That's 1-800-541-9437. And now, here is CRI's International Coordinator, Paul Carden, to introduce today's special guests. Thank you very much, Mike. Live from coast to coast, welcome to today's edition of the Bible Answer Man program. With us in the studio, first of all, is CRI senior researcher and correspondence editor, Ken Samples, who is also our in-house specialist on Roman Catholicism. Ken, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here, Paul. And across the table from Ken is our special guest, Scott Hahn, a former pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Fairfax, Virginia. Scott is a graduate of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and a doctoral candidate at Marquette University in Milwaukee. And Scott is currently assistant professor of scripture and theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville, Ohio. Scott, thank you for coming out here. Paul, Ken, thank you very much for the privilege of joining you. Ken, it's up to you now. Well, as you know, uh, whenever we deal with Catholicism, we get a tremendous response. Uh, we get many letters into the research department on the topic of Catholicism. People asking questions and asking for explanations of Catholic doctrine and practice. On the Bible Answer Man, we're often questioned about what our view is on Catholicism, uh, what separates Catholics and Evangelicals and things like that. And for our audience today, I think you have a real treat. Um, Scott Hahn is one of the most articulate spokespersons that I have met uh, when it comes to Catholic theology. And what's very interesting uh, about Scott and myself is I was uh, raised a Roman Catholic and am now a Presbyterian. Scott was raised a Presbyterian and is now a Roman Catholic. So we have gone different uh, ways when it comes to seeking a Christian truth. Scott, I'd like to welcome you to the program. I'm really happy that you're with us today. I consider it a real privilege to be able to, to join you and uh, look forward to our time. Good. Scott, a couple of years ago, uh, there was an article that was published in Christianity Today entitled, What Separates Evangelicals and Catholics? And I thought the author was uh, very articulate by saying that everything and nothing. Sometimes it seems like Catholics and Evangelicals have everything in common. Other times it seems as if they have very little, if anything, in common. I'm wondering if you could share with us from a Catholic perspective uh, what Catholics and Protestants have in common. I'm speaking here of Orthodox Catholics and Orthodox Protestants. Right. In my own experience, I uh, came to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, gave my life to him in the 70s. And I came under the influence of evangelical Christianity in a very dynamic and attractive way. And for that reason, I, I consider myself still evangelical, not in spite of my Catholicism, but you know, uh, I, I feel that the two go hand in hand. The... Uh, the experience I had, I think, might inform uh, the question somewhat. When I was uh, presented with the claims of Jesus Christ and my need for salvation, I responded by God's grace uh, with his commitment, totally trusting in Christ's grace alone, which I still do, believing that I was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, which I still believe, uh, knowing that the, even the gift of faith was a gift from God. It wasn't something that I just generated myself. These are things that Catholics believe and evangelical Protestants believe. These are substantially, this is substantial common ground. We believe in salvation by faith. We differ perhaps on uh, faith alone. As the Protestants teach, we believe by, we're saved by faith, working in love as Catholics. But from beginning to end, the whole work is of God's grace, God's grace alone. 
and it's the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's a saving death. Now, how we elaborate that, how we formulate that, and how we go on to defend it and live it out, there I think we come up with significant theological differences, and I think even more significant are the cultural differences as a result of a of a 2,000-year-old church tradition that covers the world and is thoroughly enculturated wherever it's found uh, versus an evangelical tradition that is, you know, four or 500 years old and it, it is not, it doesn't take the same attitude toward culture in the world, I think, as the Catholic Church does. But let me just say one last thought, and that is um, in the conversion process the last 10 years or so, I didn't, uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say that I, I came to this as not just a non-Catholic evangelical Protestant, but I was adamantly anti-Catholic. I was trained by people who had uh, led me to the writings of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and I had a great appreciation not only for the Gospel and the Bible, but for their formulations of theology. And I immersed myself in the writings for years, and I, I accumulated a very, a very sizable library, which I worked through, and... Uh, it wasn't until I graduated from Gordon Conwell Seminary, having studied for about eight or nine years the doctrine of the covenant, that I came to see the covenant in a very different way than I had been trained. I'd been trained to see it in a very traditional Protestant way as a contract between God and, and those individuals that he has called, elected and chosen. I began to see that the Old Testament background of the covenant was better understood as a, as a sacred family bond between God our Father, not just our judge, and all of the people of God on the earth that he has covenanted himself to as to a family that he has fathered for ages and ages. Now, as I work through the implications of that, my, doctrine, my understanding of the doctrine of justification changed, my understanding of the doctrine of the church changed. I began to see that the family of God is the master idea to the Christian faith, and then, much to my shock, I discovered that this was not only found in Catholic theologians, but the closer I got to the official documents of the Catholic Church, the more I realized that in the most authoritative teachings of the Catholic Church, this idea of the family of God was sort of like the central, all-controlling theme that integrated all of Christian faith. And so, for me, it was a shock, and it was a humiliating shock, but at the same time, it was very exhilarating to discover that for 2,000 years, God had been fathering a family full of sinners like myself, but successfully fathering a worldwide family that uh, really understood, deep down, I think, what it means to live sacramentally as the family of God. And so in 1986, I felt called by the Holy Spirit through much prayer and agonizing to uh, become a Roman Catholic. God, as we've talked about on the phone and in other places, um, Catholicism and Protestantism does in fact have much in common. Yes, indeed. The doctrine of the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, Jesus being the God-man, uh, the fact that he was virgin-born, that he rose bodily from the grave, and uh, a belief in his second coming, I'm wondering, however, many of our listeners, as we uh, seek to understand Catholicism and understand where the differences are, uh, some Protestants have expressed to me that uh, they're not sure where Catholicism stands in Scripture. Could you articulate for us exactly what the Orthodox position is, uh, the Orthodox Catholic position? Obviously, there are many liberal Catholics who wouldn't hold to it. But does Catholicism hold to an infallible Bible? Do you believe in an errant Bible? This is a good question because I think that this is an area where we do share a lot of common ground. I had the privilege of studying under Dr. R.C. Spool, one of the finest evangelical theologians in the country, and I remember him stressing over and over again that evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics actually share perhaps 98% of their theology in common. The 2% is very significant, and we have to clarify that, and we, we really have to uh, be honest there. But uh, he has a series of tapes on Roman Catholicism. Of course, I don't agree with a lot of what is in there, but his, his particular tape on Catholicism and Scripture, I think, is very illuminating. I just listened to it again recently. Because what he does, he doesn't go to the, to the popular fad theologians that grab the, the attention of the media so much as to the authoritative teachings of the church in the last century or so with regard to Scripture and its authority. For instance, he will quote Leo the Thirteenth and Providentissimus Deus or Benedict the Fifteenth and Spiritus Paracletus and all of the authoritative teachings of the Holy Fathers of the century. And what he shows quite clearly is what I have found also, and that is the Catholic, the official authoritative Catholic teaching on Scripture is that all of Scripture is inspired of God. All of Scripture is infallible. All of Scripture is not only inerrant in its uh, teachings with regard to salvation, but also history, and therefore. It is of the greatest value for the Christian to, to study and to meditate over and to contemplate prayerfully uh, every, day, every day of his or her life. And in many Catholic Bibles, this won't be of much comfort to 
evangelicals, but it, it might highlight my point. In many Catholic Bibles, there are all kinds of indulgences promised uh, <laughs> for people who will study the Scriptures assiduously on a daily basis with much prayer. And so, even if we diverge on significant doctrines, we do share the Scriptures very, very closely. And the only difference is that the Protestants believe that the Bible alone is their authority, and I believe with the Catholic Church that the Bible teaches that the Bible and a living tradition that the Holy Spirit maintains are our authority, along with the, the, the magisterium or the teaching authority of the Church. You're listening to the Bible Answer Man program with our special guest, Catholic scholar Scott Hahn, and also CRI senior research consultant Ken Samples for a Roman Catholic and Protestant dialogue. And later on in the program, we will be taking your questions as well. Well, if we could maybe move, uh, Scott, to that section where we do differ, where historic Protestantism differs with Catholic theology. I'd like to center on, uh, really, on two areas. Um, we could spend a week of shows talking about just part of these. But number one, I'd like for you to, to talk about, again, how a Catholic is saved. Um, the perception that many Protestants receive is that a Catholic is saved really by works, and that they have a low view of grace. And you said earlier that a Catholic is saved by grace alone. I'd like you to articulate that. And before he does, let me add this to the question as well. Why is it that, that evangelicals and Protestants in general have this perception that Catholics believe they are earning their salvation through their works? Good question. It's a complex one, too, so pray for me as I try to answer it. <laughs> uh, the, the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church is found in the Council of Trent. It's in Session 6 where the church gave us a decree on justification. That is where, in chapter 4, justification is defined in Catholic theology as the translation from the state in which man is born a child of the first Adam to the state of grace and of the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior. In short, as, as a great German Catholic theologian, Matthias Schieben, teaches, the essence of justification is a, is a true, real, and substantial sonship that we share and it's a divine sonship that we receive when we receive the Holy Spirit, what St. Paul calls the spirit of sonship that, ca that causes us to cry, Abba, Father. So, in short, uh, justification and, 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 and salvation as well. Uh, justification is conceived of in familistic terms, realistic, interpersonal, and dynamic, so that when we are justified, we are not simply legally acquitted or declared innocent on the, on the basis of Christ's merits. That is also affirmed by the Catholic Church, but it's not reduced to that, as in the Protestant tradition. Now, the justification is, in its essence, the full-orbed reality of becoming children of God. And so, God is not just judging us on the basis of Christ's merits, as the Protestants teach, we affirm that also, but God is fathering us as children, newborn children, who he raises in a very non-paternalistic way. That is, he expects us with his grace, with his power and life, with his wisdom and with his truth to grow up and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling so that from the moment of our justification, we are justified by a faith that is working in love. It's a faith that is the seed of sonship alive. It's not just a juridical or legal declaration of innocence. It's actually an infusion of divine sonship that causes us to stand before God and cry, Papa. And I think that is the, that is the essential meaning. Now, why, as, as Paul asks, why do so many Protestants and evangelicals misconceive that? And, and I would also add that many Catholics do as well. And I'll just say right out that if a Catholic believes that he or she is saved on the basis of legalistic works righteousness by which they bargain or contract their way into heaven, they're condemned by their own church as well as Scripture. The teaching of the church is clear, but frankly, in America, and for that matter, for the last 400 years in Western civilization, it's hard to get across the, the, the theological significance of the family. We have really forgotten the, the deep meaning of the Trinity, that our God is an eternal, divine family, and that what the Trinity is accomplishing in salvation history is purely and simply familistic. And so the family bonds of Christ's Eucharistic flesh and blood, of the baptismal grace of, of new birth, and all of these things are very hard for individualists in America especially to understand or comprehend, much less than to believe and live out. My own experience is uh, a typical American. You know, I, I define my personal freedom by the distance between me and my family. You know? And so it's not easy for me to think in a familistic way as it was, say, for the ancient Hebrews or even for somebody like St. Paul or St. John. The covenant, I believe, is the all-controlling category in Scripture. 
But the covenant theology tradition of, say, evangelical Calvinists is often skewed because I think it understands it more in terms of Western contractualism and American individualism, whereas this Hebrew familism is, is really the best way to understand it so that we can see in the Catholic teachings that the family of God is the master idea to our understanding of salvation, our understanding of the church, our understanding of Mary as a mother and the Pope as a holy father representing Christ as our true and ultimate father, the new Adam. All of these biblical categories, I think, are, are integrated in a very helpful, natural, and uh, practical way by understanding this, this central idea of the family of God. Uh, Scott, let me throw something at you. Let me throw an objection at you sure. at that point. Um, in saying that uh, a Protestant understanding of justification is somewhat just judicial, that it is not more of uh, it is not family oriented, or uh, it is somewhat limited at that point of view. Let me throw at you something. In, it seems to me, if if I understand Catholic theology correctly, and if I don't, please correct me. Um, it seems to me that justification is seen as a process. And that process is only completed as we come into the image of Christ or are changed intrinsically. And that would be uh, when a person is justified. The Catholic teaching is that justification is a past act, a present activity, and also a future reality. Because justification can be accurately reduced to the idea, it's complex but simple, the idea of divine sonship. At the moment I was born in a natural family, I was a child of my family. But I was expected and required to grow up. If at the age of two I was still uh, filling my diapers, there was no problem with that. I would be trained not to, you know. But at the age of 22, if I refused to grow up and I was not, you know, growing beyond those childish ways, something would be seriously wrong. So justification of sonship is a process because sonship itself is a dynamic, lived process whereby we mature into Christian perfection. We conform ourselves to the image of the firstborn among many brethren, as Romans 8 says. So, you know, I, I also, I have to confess that, you know, I have read and reread uh, dozens and dozens of times, not only James chapter 2, verse 24, but also Paul's teaching on justification in, in Romans 3 and 4. And I think that the evangelical Protestant tradition, as I understand it, has normally interpreted Paul's thought in light of the the, the Roman courtroom, whereas I think his prime controlling category is the Hebrew covenant, that is the Hebrew sacred family that, that God himself has fathered through history. And with that in mind, I think we'd understand why, in, for instance, in, in Romans 4, verse 3, when Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6 and says that Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness, it's not referring just to the very beginning of Abraham's salvation experience because it's taken from Genesis 15. It would almost require us to believe that Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, and 14 wasn't saved, wasn't justified. In Genesis 12, of course, he leaves his kindred, he leaves his homeland, he follows God, he accepts the promise by faith, he goes to the promised land. In Genesis 13 and 14, he, he fights against armies that have captured his nephew, he tithes to Melchizedek, he's blessed by Melchizedek, he shows himself to be an opponent of the evil in Sodom. He's done so much before you get to Genesis 15, 6, that I think you're hard-pressed to see Paul uh, twisting a text out of context and suggesting that up until Genesis 15, Abraham had not been regenerated. He did not have a saving faith. He didn't have a personal relationship with, with, with God. I think that Genesis 15:6 is actually highlighting his justified status as a growing son of God on the basis of the fact that from before Genesis 15, going back to chapter 12, 13, and 14, he is God's son. Scott, it seems to me that uh, it's very easy to misunderstand and uh, really attribute things to the Catholic Church that they do not believe. It seems to me that, uh, in summary, you're saying that Catholicism really does believe in salvation by grace alone, although you would not accept that as through faith alone, but that it, there would be an intimate relationship of that faith and works. Is that a, is that a fair summary? of what Catholics believe. Can I appreciate your attitude and your fairness. That, I think, is a very fair summary. We are saved by God's grace alone from beginning to end. Everything that I do that pleases the Father in heaven, anything that I do that might in some way accomplish what we could call a merit, is only understood properly within the family. As the Father fills his children with his life and with his love and with his wisdom, and the children grow up and live out that, then when they do things that please and merit, as St. Augustine says, when God rewards us, he's only crowning his own works in us. 
And again, the family of God idea, I think, helps us understand how true that is. The Catholic Church rejects the notion of sola fide, or that we're justified by faith solely, or faith alone, because Paul never says faith alone. He does say we're justified by faith apart from works of the law, by which the Catholic Church understands him talking about circumcision and the ritual of the Mosaic Law, which was done away with in the New Covenant. Now, nowhere do we find anywhere in the Bible the, the statement that we're justified by faith alone. We do find in James 2.24, uh, the Apostle James said, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so I felt compelled to follow the Word of God and, and saying, look, if James, led by the Holy Spirit, can say that we're not justified by faith alone, and St. Paul never really said that we're justified by faith alone, I felt in, in conscience I had to follow our Lord and His Word in uh, affirming what the Catholic Church teaches. That is some very, very thought-provoking teaching, Scott, and a little later here we'll be able to interact with our listeners on just these points, and I know they have a lot to say. You're listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast, and there's something I hope every single listener understands. You have a part in this ministry. This very broadcast and so many other facets of CRI's outreach are made possible through your prayers and your financial gifts. This week is our way of saying thanks for your gift of $20 or more. We want to send you Walter Martin's book, The New Age Cult along with a special bibliography on the New Age Movement for follow-up study. Again, we depend on your support. And when you write us with your gift of $20 or more this week, we'll send you the New Age Cult if you'll just ask for radio offer number 124. That's radio offer number 124. Let us know you believe in giving people answers and in strengthening the body of Christ through sound doctrine. Write us this week. Our address is CRI, Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California. The zip code is 926 Nine three, And this offer is available only to our U.S. listeners. We're coming up to a station break, but don't go away. We'll be right back with your calls and more of Ken Samples and Catholic scholar Scott Hahn. The Bible Answer Man program is a presentation of the Christian Research Institute. If you hear something today that creates a question in your mind, don't hesitate to contact our research department at CRI. Our address is the Christian Research Institute, Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. For those of you staying with us, we'll be right back with more of the Bible Answer Man program. With a staff of well-educated research experts, under the leadership of President Hank Hanegraaff, we're ready to answer your questions about the scripture, cults, the occult, atheism, world religions, even areas of false teachings from within the church. Our address is CRI, Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. And now let's continue with Paul Carden, Ken Samples, and today's special guest as we discuss Catholicism and Reformation theology. Thank you, Mike. We are back live from coast to coast talking about Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, the issues that divide us and the issues that unite us. And we are taking your calls. If you have a question for Ken Samples or Scott Hahn, please do call us at one 800 821 Four four nine zero. And once again, Ken, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here, Paul. And Scott, it's a privilege to have you with us in the studio. Thanks for inviting me. Let's go to our callers. The switchboard is lit up. Here's Connie in Austin, Texas, listening on station KIXL. Hello, Connie. What's your question? First of all, I'll be able to get through. Um, I have a question about Old Catholicism, and I was wondering how much you guys knew about that, and if you have any literature to send me. What would you like to know about Catholicism? Yes, Connie, my knowledge of that, and Scott, you can chip in here, my knowledge of that is that Old Catholicism is, is very similar to Roman Catholicism. However, it would reject the primacy of the papacy as well as the infallibility of the Pope. That's my understanding of that. Um, you could get some good information from that just by writing in or holding on. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know a whole lot. I do think that they, at least some of them, affirm the primacy of the Pope. At least they did originally when it broke off in Germany in the 19th century. However, I'd have to say that what I understand of the old Catholic Church now is that it's really deviated much farther from not only Catholic theology, but also what we might just call generic evangelical theology. In other words, the old Catholic Church now is, is, is dealing with issues of... Um, of, of morals that represent very serious differences that would, I think, divide them from evangelicals and Catholics. Can you give us an example? Well, I, I, I hesitate, but I, 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 under, I understand that uh, the issue of abortion is being discussed, 
and the uh, the validity of abortions for Christians is a, a live issue, and along with that, several others. But uh, again, I'm not I'm not really the one to talk to about that. But Connie, we do have information in our library and files. If you'd like to stay on the line, we will be happy to send you what information we can. Thank you very much for your call. Please do stay on the line. Now let's go to Gary in El Paso, Texas, listening on station KELP. Gary, thank you for calling. Yes, this is Gary Barnes. I'm calling from El Paso, Texas. Very good. What's your question? Well, who am I speaking to? Paul or Kent? This is Paul Carton. Paul Carton? Are we live across all 50 states of the United States of America? <laughs> Many, if not most of them. So we're live. Yes, we are. What's your question? My question is, uh, the uh, Catholic Church, is this, I only have one question. Is the Catholic Church the true church, the only church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Okay, Ken and Scott, what do you say about that? Well, I, as a Catholic, I would have to say yes, but as a Bible Christian, I also came to the shocking discovery that, yes, the Bible teaches it as well. There's one simple way to approach it. That is, what do you call a father who fathers two or three different families? In my experience, you would call him a scoundrel. <laughs> uh, a, a, a father is glorified by the success with which he uh, fathers one family, and God, who is the Lord of history and the Lord of this world, has fathered one family, and to it, through Christ, by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, he has committed a liturgy, he has committed a doctrine, he has committed a moral system of teaching, and he has also, through the Holy Spirit, raised up a teaching hierarchy so that, uh, just as it was in the Old Testament, so now, even more so in the New Testament, the infallible love and truth of Christ can come across to his family. And so, really, when you look around the world, there's only one job applicant for that position, and that is the Catholic Church, which believes that it is the one true church, and that the popes do represent an unbroken line of succession going back to Peter, who Jesus appointed to be the, the prime minister, as it were, over the, the Twelve and over the Church. That's the Roman Catholic answer. Now Ken Samples with a Protestant answer. Well, I would say, Paul and uh, Gary, I would say that the true Church is all of those individuals who are trusting in Jesus Christ for their salvation. I would say with Augustine that God has an invisible Church, and I would reject the idea that any particular body is God's exclusive church. And because I would differ with the Catholic Church over the doctrine of justification and authority, I am uh, a Reformed Christian. But I would say the true church are all of those people in the Catholic, among Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, etc., who trust Jesus Christ for their salvation. Does that answer your question, Gary? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It sure does. I'd like to also thank the entire... Uh, Bible Answer Man program at Christian Research Institute, CRA, CRI, and Mike Stevens and Hank Hanegraaff. I appreciate all the work you've done, and I'll be listening to you, and I hope to talk to you again. Thank you very much, Gary. Please do be praying for us. Yes, I will. Thank, Thank you, you for your call. God bless. Question now from Artis in Sacramento, California. The station is KFIA. Welcome, Artis. My question that I have is regarding the Pope. I've been recently doing some research on the Antichrist, and I noticed one of his characteristics were that the number of the beast for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. My question is, does the Pope name in Latin translate out to 666? Okay, the question is, does the name of the current Pope, Pope John Paul II, uh, add up to that? Latin, in Latin. In Latin, very good. Okay, Scott? Well, you would probably expect me to say no, and so I'll say no. <laughs> I would also recommend a book that deals with the issue of the Pope as Antichrist. It's by Carl Keating, the founder of Catholic Answers and the present director. It's entitled Catholicism and Fundamentalism, the Attack on Romanism by Bible Christians. Uh, he has a chapter in which he deals with the uh, very common objection. Now, I have to also say that for many years, I, as a Presbyterian, I believed and taught that the Pope was the, was the Antichrist. In fact, in my seminary, I was one of two uh, seminarians in the Presbyterian Fellowship who, who taught that and wanted all Presbyterians to teach it as well, because the claims and demands made by the Pope and the Church are so great. The, uh, the change in my mind came about, and I might add that the uh, other guy who also believed that of the Pope is also now a Catholic along with me. He was one of my closest friends. But in my study of Matthew 16, I came to the conclusion that Jesus had entrusted the keys of the kingdom to Peter, much like in the Old Testament the son of David would entrust the keys of the kingdom to the prime minister. And that if you go back to Isaiah 22, what the popes were claiming for themselves uh, with uh, this understanding of the keys was not only a dynastic authority, 
representing Christ the King, but also dynastic succession, as it was practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years by the Davidic kingdom, which Christ came to perfect, not do away with. So for me, of course, John Paul II is not the Antichrist. I, I know of no way that you can come up with 666 with his name, and I, I do believe that he is a father figure symbolizing the unity of God's family on earth. Maybe I should be more specific. The name Victorious Five Die. Uh, I did a little research on that, and the way they uh, broke the name down in numerical numbers according to the Roman uh, numbers, it translates out to 606. So is that incorrect or correct? Yeah, in the book by Carl Keating, he deals at length with this particular work, and he shows that the, uh, the, uh, the, the particular title that you just gave, which is a common charge in anti-Catholic literature, has never been used by the Catholic Church or by the Pope to describe the Pope. And so it's basically a, a Latin neologism, a, a phrase invented to try to come up with a kind of arithmetic way of associating the Pope with the number 666. Artist, I might add, is a, is a Protestant evangelical. I would be very careful of trying to come up with uh, what words mean in Latin and then trying to arrive at the number of the beast. I think a Protestant can say that uh, where we believe that the Roman uh, pontiff agrees with Scripture, we affirm that. If we feel that there are areas where he is not in accord with Scripture, then we would oppose that. But I think that it takes a lot of stretching and imagination and often real misguided thinking to use things like that. Now, I, and I will say this. During the Reformation, some of the Reformers did believe that the Pope was Antichrist, but the majority of evangelical scholars today do not hold that viewpoint. It was, unfortunately, a view that united uh, Luther, Calvin, Knox, Cranmer, Zwingli. In fact, all of the Reformers uh, differed among themselves on many issues, but that was one unfortunate cause that united them all. And I might mention on, uh, on that issue, uh, it's page 221 and 222 in Carl Keating's book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, where he debunks that myth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your call. And by the way, listeners who would like Ken Sample's review of this book, just write us at the Christian Research Institute, and you'll get his perspective on where he feels Carl Keating of Catholic Answers is on target and where he's off base. Once again, you're listening to the Bible Answer Man program, sponsored by the Christian Research Institute, with Presbyterian scholar and former Roman Catholic Ken Samples, and former Presbyterian minister and Roman Catholic scholar Scott Hahn. Let's go to our next caller. Harry in Haverhill, Massachusetts, listening on station WEZE. You're on the air. Doing pretty well. What's your question? I was always glad I got on the air. I'm always, always confused. Uh, I'm not Catholic. Then. But I was sort of confused. Uh, I know in the, in the evangelical church, we teach that faith and repentance and grace saves us from that, you know, basic evangelical stand. But I, I guess the guest, um, Scott, I used to believe, I, I would suppose, he was Presbyterian. And with the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, I don't go for the extremist, you know, Jack Chicken, that crap. Because I don't believe that nonsense. But with, I've got the, you know, 16 documents of Vatican II, and I've went to the catechisms themselves, as well as other sources, too. And I just don't see that, that the way we believe about salvation is the way they do. And if, and if CRI is going to... Uh, say that the Mormons, I know I know the Catholic Church probably got to their beliefs about salvation differently than the Mormons do, so I'm not trying to equate them. But if, if, the, if the Catholic Church bottom line says it isn't faith and grace alone, you have to work your way to the sacraments, they may not like that phraseology, but they have to add the baptism with the Vatican, the Second Vatican Council called the sacraments of salvation, which includes baptism, and persevering and so forth. And then you can never be sure of salvation. Then when you die, you have to go to purgatory to, to, to burn out your excess sin. So like, you know, the, rich, the eternal Richard Simmons thing. That's not a story. That's just a joke. But it's sort of like that way. And then when you're ready, you'll go to heaven. And that, that is still going back on our works. And for me, that is a false gospel. Okay, Harry, I, I think what you're thinking and saying reflects what a lot of our listeners may be thinking and saying. And it's important for Ken Samples to address that. Harry, I would say this, that uh, Scott and I differ. Um, I feel that the formula of salvation by grace alone through faith alone is in fact what the New Testament teaches. I think, however, uh, one of the very important reasons that we have Scott Hahn on the program is to allow him to articulate the Catholic position, to allow you to call in and, and write in and, and talk with us about these and have good interaction. 
Scott and I differ at this point, and I would say that I believe that the Catholic view of salvation is is distorted. I think that it is off base. But to to put the Catholic Church in the camp with non Christian sects such as Mormonism, I think is really uh, misguided and inaccurate. No, no, I'm, not, I'm not doing that totally because they do believe in the Trinity, so they um, they do believe in the physical resurrection, they do believe in you know, stuff like that. So I'm not equating the two entirely. Okay, I, I would dis I I disagree with the Catholic position, but let's let Scott address it. All right, let me reaffirm the fact that the Catholic Church teaches de fide and requires all Catholics to believe and live out the fact that we are saved by grace alone. And that is not by faith alone. It's by faith working in love, the phrase that St. Paul uses in, in Galatians chapter 4. Now, the... The grace that we are saved by is a living, dynamic, active faith. It's the life of a son that Christ communicates to us. So when we are called in Philippians 2, verse 13, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that's in the imperative tense. You can't do away with the absolute necessity of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when we do, we only do because, as Paul continued to say, God is at work in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So that the works that we do that please him are really the works of Christ in and through us. Apart from Christ, I can do nothing, but in Christ, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So the idea of works is not an idea of contractual labor that we put in in order to kind of bargain our way into heaven. It's a family notion whereby the Father pours an active, dynamic power into our lives for us to live out the life of Christ. The sacraments, for instance. The word sacramentum in Latin comes from oath. In the New Covenant, what makes the New Covenant so distinctive and new is that God himself swears the oaths. The sacraments are Christ's actions. He does them through the members, the living members organically united to him in the body of Christ. But when the sacraments are administered, these are not man-made rituals. These are not mechanical, magical means to bypass holiness and faith. These are the actions of Christ in the body of Christ through the members of Christ to empower us to live lives that imitate Christ. And this is not just some novel, innovative interpretation of the church. This is really what you find, and it's what I found much to my shock when I actually dug deep into the official teachings of the church. Now, with regard to purgatory, when we turn to 1 Corinthians 3, we see St. Paul emphasizing greatly the necessity for works that we have to add to the foundation, which is Christ. Now, some of those works will be wood, hand, straw, which will be burned up. Others will be gold and silver and precious stones. But, you know, as he says in verse 14, if the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, that fire might be a moment, it might be a minute, it might be more. But it's, it's a fire that purifies false, evil works that were done in hypocrisy. St. Paul, so, Paul affirms the need for good works and also the judgment of those works through a fiery ordeal in which some will suffer. They will suffer loss, but they themselves will suffer. It's not because Christ's work is inadequate. It's because people were fraudulently living out works claiming to be Christ, which really weren't. Okay. Harry, we appreciate your call and your question very much. We need to be fair to our other callers and keep the program moving. But thank you once again. Coming up this week on the Bible Answer Man program, tomorrow our in-studio guest will be Dr. Harold O.J. Brown, the author of the landmark book, Heresies, The Image of Christ in the Mirror of Heresy and Orthodoxy from the Apostles to the Present. A fascinating book. He's going to be a fascinating guest. You don't want to miss this program. On Wednesday, our guest will be Dr. Ted Baer of Good News Communications. Dr. Baer will be talking with CRI President Hank Hanegraaff about the impact of the cults and the occult in today's media. On Thursday, CRI researchers will be taking your questions on the cults and other topics. And on Friday, we'll have more of the best of Walter Martin. All of this coming up this week on the Bible Answer Man program. Russell in Boston, Massachusetts, listening on station WEZE. You're on the air. Hello, Russell. Hello. Yes, what's your, yes, what's your question? Yes, I was uh, reading in a book that was, uh, like, it was speaking about official Catholic teaching, and it uh, had the imprimatur, and it was talking about the scapula. And the teaching that was supposed to be official Catholic doctrine was that if you wore the scapula faithfully, that uh, you could get out of purgatory the next Saturday after you die. And uh, isn't that salvation by works? Okay, let's let's explain, Ken, for a moment. What is a scapula? 
Well, Scott could probably explain this a lot better than me. Why don't you go ahead? All right. A scapular is, is, a, is an object worn over the shoulders, and it goes back to the Carmelite order, which is traced back in some way to uh, St. Simon Stock and a vision that he had of Christ and Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who gave to him uh, this, this physical sign uh, to, to promote and to encourage purity and sanctity. So it is not, again, a, a mechanical or, or magical object. It's rather a, a sacramental sign of our commitment to Christ to live out the life of purity and sanctity that he calls us to. The Blessed Virgin Mary also embodied as the perfect disciple and follower of Christ. The scapular, the teaching with regard to the scapular might be found in books with an imprimatur, but that does not mean that just because you have a nihil obstat or an imprimatur or some kind of ecclesiastical approval, that the contents of those books are de fide. That is, uh, they are not required of all Catholics to believe or to wear, for instance, in the case of the scapular. It just means that the book has been approved and it is not patently offensive. It does not teach anything blatantly heretical. You'd rather go to the official and authoritative teachings of the Catholic Church. You, you find them in the documents of Vatican II, or you could find them in the famous book, uh, Denzinger's Sources of Catholic Dogma, which is an English translation uh, published by Marion House in the 13th edition, or actually the, the, uh, the 30th edition I have in front of me. And there you'll find what uh, the Church and what the Holy Spirit require of faithful Catholics to believe and do. Thank you very much for your question. Let's go on to our next caller. Joe in Atlanta, Georgia, listening on station WNIV. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, yes, I, I had a question for Scott on the confession uh, and whether Catholics could ever really be sure that their sins had been forgiven once they went to confession. Uh, if a Catholic uh, says a bad confession, uh, I believe the law says that even though the has absolved him, that uh, his sin still remains. And if the priest is not in good standing with the church, even though he had been absolved by the priest, that is still remained as well. Uh, so how could a Catholic ever be truly sure that his sins had been forgiven, even though he went to uh, the confessional and been absolved by the priest? Well, the, uh, the, the idea of the sacrament, again, is the oath that Christ swears to provide whatever we lack. If we approach the sacrament of confession with true sorrow for sin, or just a true and sincere fear of God's judgment, uh, or just simply, better yet, the love of Christ and his law, which we have fallen short of, then Christ swears the oath to provide the grace that we need to make up for what we lack. And that is the assurance that we have. It's not an absolute airtight assurance. I don't find anywhere on the pages of the scripture, for instance, Scott Hahn is one of the elect and he is destined for heaven with certainty. I do accept all that the, all that the Bible teaches as divinely inspired and infallibly true, and all that the church teaches as well. But I don't find in Revelation any proposition with regard to my own individual salvation. So I don't have absolute certainty, but I do have what the church calls moral certitude. It's analogous to the certitude that I have with regard to my parents. I believe that my mom and my dad are my mom and my dad, and that I am their little child, and you know, I'm growing up in their love, and so on and so forth. But you know, they could have forged the birth certificate. They could have you know, forged the, uh, the footprints. They could have done all kinds of things to just get me and deceive me. And I'll never have absolute 100% epistemological certainty, but what I do have is moral certitude, moral assurance. And likewise, in the sacrament of confession, I have moral assurance that if I come sincerely and sorrowful, that Christ will give me the grace not only to forgive my sins, but the grace to strengthen me for righteousness. And that is real, substantial assurance. So I appreciate your question very much. We need to go to one more caller, but thank you very much. Nancy in Fullerton, California is on the line listening on KKLA. Mary, you're on the air. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm really thankful to be talking with you gentlemen today with um, a Protestant and a Catholic. Uh, this question's been on my mind for some time. If you could state it very briefly, I'm sorry, we're short on time. And if you could please, Nancy, speak up a little bit more so we can all hear the question. I would like an explanation on the Catholic doctrine on Mary. And I would also like a little bit of information on the difference between the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox position. Then, if you could please give me CRI's scriptural position concerning the apparition of Mary in Yugoslavia. Well, let's see what we can do in about a minute and a half. Scott? All right. The key, I think, to understand the Catholic Church's teaching on Mary is simple, and it's Christ-centered. That is, Jesus Christ in accepting the mission of the Father to become human and to fulfill the law perfectly in all righteousness, as it's summed up in the Ten Commandments, came and did just that. And when you see the law summed up in the Ten Commandments, the first half deals with our relationship to God. The second half of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship to our fellow man and woman. 
Now, the first of those in the second table of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and mother. The Hebrew word kavodah means to glorify or to bestow honor, bestow glory upon your father and mother. Now, Mary was, by God's grace, the natural mother of Jesus Christ. When he came to fulfill the law of his father and, and complete the mission in all righteousness, one of the things that he did was to honor his mother in the most perfect and righteous way imaginable, so that the church does not initiate the honor and the devotion to Our Lady. Rather, Christ, as a faithful, loving son, who's perfectly faithful to the law of his father, honors his mother, and we simply imitate Christ. I would just add that in the journal, over the next three issues, we'll be having articles about uh, Marian apparitions, and I will be writing the article on the apparition in Medjugorje. So be looking forward to that. Okay. Are you aware there's a conference in Irvine in August on this, uh, on this matter? I'm not. Uh, why don't you drop the information in an envelope? I'd be glad to look it over. Great. I will. And I would like to stay on the line and, and request the journal. Yes, we'd be happy to make that available to you. Thank you very much. Scott, we're out of time, but we're so grateful that you've joined us today. Thank you very much. I count this just a great grace and privilege. And I also want to say one last thing briefly, and that is the pro-life movement is another important area of common ground where we can stand together as evangelicals and Catholics and really work for common cause with God's help. Thank you so much. Ken, in five seconds, anything to wrap up the program? I want to encourage dialogue between Catholics and evangelicals and to encourage people to study the scriptures and to really affirm truth. Excellent. We'll have more of that on the program soon as you'll be joining us again. And I want to remind our listeners once again that this week's radio offer is Dr. Walter Martin's book, The New Age Cult, along with a bibliography on the New Age movement to help you pursue your studies in this important area. This ministry depends on your support. And when you write us with your gift of $20 or more this week, we'll be glad to send you The New Age Cult if you'll just ask for radio offer number 124. That's radio offer number 124. Our address is CRI, Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California. The zip code is 92693. Or if you'd like to place a request by phone, dial us at 714-855-9926. And once again, this offer is available only to our U.S. listeners. That's all for today, but we'll be back tomorrow with more of the Bible Answer Man program with special guest Dr. Harold O.J. Brown. Till then, God bless you, and so long. Live via satellite... You've been listening to the Bible Answer Man program presented by the Christian Research Institute in Southern California. If you've heard something today on the broadcast that's prompted a question in your mind about the scripture, doctrine, cults, the occult, atheism, world religions, or aberrant Christian theology, be sure and write to our research department. At CRI, we carry a wide variety of pamphlets, tracts, books, and a large number of lectures and interviews on audio cassette tape all dedicated to answering your questions and strengthening your faith. Ask for the CRI resource list when you write. Our address is the Christian Research Institute, or CRI, Post Office Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. Once again, that's CRI, Post Office Box 500, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. Include the call letters of this station and the date of today's broadcast. Be sure and join us each weekday on the Bible Answer Man program. On behalf of President Hank Hanegraaff and the entire staff of CRI, this is Mike Stevens wishing you the Lord's best of everything always as you open your heart to His Son.